With that, could I ask, remind folks, the blue ticket to your reception, this would be a perfect time to take out your pen and start filling that out rather than wait till the end of that. So um, my favorite introduction is now I get to introduce one of our uh, terrific advisory board members, um, Erica Karp, who is with Cornerstone Capital and uh, based in New York, advises uh, companies and investors. Uh, on ESG matters and is just been a delightful addition to the SAI Advisory Board. And with that, uh, Erica Karp. Does everyone know that Mark is kind of one of the kind of seminal people in sustainability, corporate sustainability and corporate data? Can, I mean, thank you. Um, it's really, really particularly fun for me to introduce um, Robin from, uh, from JetBlue. And I have to say that, you know, in my years um, thinking about companies and working uh, with analysts, JetBlue has always come up when it comes to the issue of corporate sustainability. By the way, um, in my language, corporate sustainability is the relentless pursuit of material progress towards a more regenerative and inclusive global economy. So that's corporate sustainability, and, and thank you for what you've done. Um, Robin made the comment um, somewhere along the way, I saw you make a comment that, um, that you hope to kind of spark a passion for aviation in your colleagues and, and in, in you know, the next generation, and I think that's really beautiful. And 20 years ago, the founder of JetBlue um, made a comment that he wanted to bring humanity um, back to the industry. And I think that's fantastic, too, because we work in an industry in the capital markets where, to some degree, the humanity has been sucked out. And people think about capitalism and economics, and they think about, you know, Adam Smith and the invisible hand and maximizing profitability. And that's all terrific, but we have really messed up in terms of going too far. And what we need to do is go back to the history of economic thought and remember that Adam Smith wrote the theory of moral sentiments before the work that most people know. Within that theory of moral sentiments, we know, Adam Smith said, that human beings have an exquisite interest in the circumstances of others. And so when we talk about travel and tourism, you know, that's what it's about, getting to know the circumstances of others, the people, the places, bringing humanity back to what we all do. And when we think about the travel industry, travel and tourism is a massive industry. We're talking about north of 10% of global GDP as travel and tourism. That's how big it is. We're talking about 290 million jobs, either direct or indirectly related to travel and tourism. One in every 10 jobs on the planet. So when we think about whether or not this industry is important, you know, I think we know the answer to that. And so thinking about, again, JetBlue, what they do, the decisions the company and Robin have to make, the hard choices when it comes to fuel or gates or job cuts or anything else, it's a big challenge. There's no black and white, and it's about balance. Again, moving towards the relentless pursuit of material progress towards a more regenerative and inclusive global economy. And thinking about that, and thinking about travel, and thinking about what capitalism could be if we bring, again, humanity back, um, I think about uh, Le Petit Prince, if you remember that book. If you want to teach someone to build a boat, you don't send them out into the woods to chop the wood and put the pieces together and do all that work. You teach them to yearn for the beautiful expanse of the sea. And then they'll figure out how to build a boat. So I don't have a boat to talk about. We have some planes to talk about. Um, Robin, did I hear that a baby was born last week on one of your flights? Yeah. yeah. Mazel tov, as we say. <laughs> Anyway, it really is. It's a privilege. It's a pleasure. And thank you for being here. Robin Hale.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, with that great opening, I really don't have anything left to say. So have you got any questions? Okay, uh, my name's uh, Robin uh, Hayes. I've been in the airline industry uh, all of my life, and uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to uh, convey some of that for you. Uh, I'm here with some colleagues, uh, uh, JC from our investor relations team, uh, Sophia who runs our, um, stand up JC, uh, Sophia who runs our uh, sustainability and ESG team, uh, Brandon Nelson who's our uh, general counsel and corporate secretary, and Steve Priest who is our long, actually not so long suffering CFO. Uh, okay, so uh, um, they, uh, they, they don't like me having too much fun and so they stripped all of the airplane pictures out of my presentation. And all I remember have to do is to press this. Okay, that is the safe harbor statement that I'm not going to read. Okay, so uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about um, how we think about uh, uh, ESG uh, in uh, JetBlue. So uh, who's flown JetBlue? Uh, who's TrueBlue? Any TrueBlue members in the room? Any Mosaic members? Okay, we need to work on that. There's a few of you. But uh, anyway, so, you know, uh, as... Uh, as was said in the introduction, uh, David Neilman founded JetBlue, uh, actually we're just over 19 years uh, since our first flight. And David uh, had a long history in the airline industry, a much more successful history than me. And David wanted to create an airline with his team to bring humanity back to air travel. Um, every two weeks I go down to orientation at JetBlue University uh, in Orlando to meet all of our new crew members. Crew members are our word for employees. And we play this game in the first part of the morning. And it's called mergers, bankruptcy, or both. And we talk about the terrible history in our industry. And it's not just terrible for the people that fly in the airlines. It's terrible for people who wanted to make careers in the industry. And you know, I'm passionate about this as an industry because I truly believe, particularly in the US, it's changed for, for good in that it's sustainably profitable now but we've got to make it exciting for young people to come into it. Uh, and we struggle with that a little bit. And there were some great jobs, and there were also some great jobs for people in our industry without college degrees as well. Uh, so it's a passion of mine. But JetBlue was born, as I mentioned, to uh, bring humanity back to air travel. And to put it simply, what we try and do is offer a better service at a lower fare. And what we think is our most sustainable competitive advantage over time is our, um, is our culture and our people. Uh, and so we've done a number of innovative things over the years. You know, we uh, offer the most legroom of uh, any airline. Uh, we're the only first airline to roll out high-speed uh, broadband uh, Wi-Fi for free. Uh, we disrupted the uh, market between the East Coast and the West Coast with our Mint uh, premium uh, service, which had a significant uh, lowering of the fares. And you know, we position ourselves really between the low-cost carriers uh, and the legacy airlines. And we've done a pretty good job over the years at getting a revenue premium that is pretty close to the legacy, the unit revenue that's pretty close to the legacy airlines, but we ha without having that sort of uh, heavy corporate travel penetration, without having that global uh, corporate uh, network. We're still predominantly a leisure airline. About 80% of our business is, uh, is leisure. And, uh, you know, we're definitely much stronger on the East Coast than the West Coast. Um, and um, uh, about 44%, just under half of our revenue, comes from the East Coast. We have uh, what we call six focus cities. Um, we uh, don't use the word hub. One of the differences between our business model and that of the uh, legacy airlines is most of our business is point to point. In fact, uh, less than 15% of customers who fly JetBlue are flying to connect. Uh, you know, JFK is not a great place to connect. Um, uh, and so, but we've built strong presence on the East Coast with Boston in New York, uh, Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, with the largest airline in San Juan uh, and Puerto Rico. Uh, and also we have a, a small focus city on the West Coast, uh, which we call the LA Basin, including, uh, including Long Beach. And you can see, uh, um, you know, every year, we look at the on-time performance and you know, we always get criticized for being uh, so low on the rankings. And it's just a challenge of having so much for capacity on the East Coast. 25% of total air traffic control delays 
uh, in the US happen in the New York area. Uh, and I don't need to tell you that if you live in around New York, uh, but there's a lot of pressure uh, on, our, on our system here in the US. But you see, we are very dependent uh, on our network on the East Coast. And you know, when I go back in time, one of the challenges that we had in the investor community uh, a few years ago was that, yeah, you've got this great product, I love flying you, uh, but your, mar your margins are lower than your competitors. And if we look back uh, to 2013, 2014, we were about uh, four or five percent below uh, our industry competitors. And I don't need to tell you that uh, that is not a sustainable place to be. And so we had to make a number of changes to our business model. We didn't stray too far from where we were. You know, we still wanted to be, make sure we were offering our customers a, a better product. Uh, but we, we had to make some uh, changes to our business model uh, to close the gap. And I'm pleased to say that we did. Uh, in 2015, we'd nearly caught up. Uh, in 2016 and 2017, we were slightly ahead of the industry. Uh, we've fallen a li little bit behind in 2018. But then we announced um, back at the end of, uh, in October last year, a series of initiatives between now and 2020 that we believe will take us to uh, producing uh, superior margins again, again, without changing who we are as, a, as an airline. And I, you know, I talk about uh, why we're different. I think one of the most important things for all of us at JetBlue is our values. And a lot of companies talk about this, um, but actions speak louder than words. And the first thing when you do, when you join JetBlue, you go to orientation, and every single new employee or crew member goes through this. <coughs> and the first th thing we do, uh, even before they play my merger, bankruptcy, or both game, is we talk about the five values. And the values are up here. I don't need to read them out. Obviously, all wrapped in the sort of number one value of safety. But we truly believe that uh, it's our culture, it's our commitment to values, it's our culture that and underpins uh, the success of our company. And culture is not just about money. I think culture is about time. It's about being there for your frontline crew members. It's about frontline crew members seeing leaders like me as they, our main responsibility is remove obstacles that get in the way of doing the job that they need to to do. We have an open door policy that any frontline crew member can approach any member of leadership directly. You don't have to go through your chain of command. Leaders work in airports. Leaders clean airplanes. You'll be pleased to know we don't fly airplanes or fix airplanes. Uh, but we all invest a lot of time in our frontline with our frontline crew members to help understand what gets in their way uh, and what we can do to try and make that uh, easier uh, for them. And you know, we, we passionately believe that by focusing on our crew members, by focusing on our culture, means that they will offer our customers a better service. It's much easier to smile uh, when it's authentic rather than having someone telling you to smile. It's much easier to provide that service when you know you have a supportive leader that you can go to when you need something uh, from them. And so we put a lot of focus on that, and we believe that focus on our people to drive that service to our customers also is what drives shareholder returns because it allows us to get some of the revenue uh, performance that we have seen over the last few years. I do need some water. Oh, it's Nestle. That's good. So we've also done a lot of work trying to correlate um, these values with, you know, it can't just be talk, like what does it actually lead? And so, again, uh, we have a lot of data from our crew members, we have a lot of data from our customers, and you can, uh, in this world of, uh, we, didn't, we weren't calling it big data back then, uh, we just thought we were doing analysis, uh, but we can see that customer satisfaction is higher, 18% higher uh, when, uh, in airports, when our crew members who work in airports truly affirm their trust in our values. We have, in our reservation crew members, they're the ones who answer the phone when you call, um, they're 21% more likely to sell additional ancillary revenue and process 18% more calls per month when they feel uh, uh, that they feel a real sense of connection with our, our values. 
And also, uh, in our support centers, we don't have a head office because everyone who doesn't work on the front line, we say in JetBlue there's only two types of crew members, those who serve, the front, those who serve customers or those who serve those that do. Uh, and so we don't have uh, headquarters, we have support centers. And we see 81% lower attrition from crew members in those support centers, again, when they affirm their trust in JetBlue's values. And so, you know, the, the, I think the, uh, the thing I would say about our industry, uh, for those of you who know it or cover it, is that it's got a history of being very cyclical, uh, very short term, uh, you know, a fairly uh, uh, crummy record actually for all stakeholders, whether it's customers, whether it's uh, shareholders, or whether it's uh, uh, employees. And so we outlined um, at our uh, investor day, uh, we had an investor day actually on October the 3rd. I remember that because it was a German reunification day and I used to live in Germany. Uh, and we outlined a series of initiatives that would, as I mentioned earlier, by 2020, take us to a position where we were delivering uh, superior margins. And uh, you know, I'm not going to, for this, we don't have time to go through all of them here because I want to talk to you about some of the longer term uh, benefits and how we look at this through an ESG lens. Uh, and so uh, Sophia did a very nice thing. She took those and she combined them into uh, a couple of themes uh, of what I want to talk to you uh, about today. So we took the network and fleet uh, building blocks together. We took the cost and the uh, product offering together uh, and uh, capital allocation uh, as another uh, uh, platform. Uh, and each of those had targets through to 2020. And, you know, again, it's about focusing on the short term but it's also making sure you're building your company for the long term, particularly in our business, uh, which is, has such a long uh, planning cycle. And I think uh, a criticism that I would make of our industry over the, over the years and years is we've been very, very short term focused. So when we talk about, first of all, uh, network and fleet, let's talk about that first. Um, so uh, fuel is a huge input cost uh, that, that we have. Uh, and um, there's also uh, a lot of interest around the world on how to regulate uh, carbon emissions. Uh, and there's also thinking around scenario planning. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that in terms of some of the hurricane events that we've, weather events that we've seen. So uh, most of our cap capex every year goes on uh, new airplanes. And one of the things that Steve has been leading is a fundamental uh, change to our long-term fleet plan to focus on more fuel-efficient airplanes. Uh, so we have uh, 60 E-190s, that's the Embraer 190 uh, in our fleet. Uh, we have announced that we are replacing those uh, with the Airbus 220. This is gonna give us 40% uh, lower fuel burn per seat uh, and 30% lower operating costs per seat than the 190s. Uh, they will drive significant margin benefit. Uh, and we also have ordered, we have on order 85 uh, Airbus 321 NEOs, which is the new engine option. Uh, we take the first of those this year. And again, compared to the air, 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 aircraft that they are um, coming after, the previous version of the 321, Again, very significant fuel burn uh, savings, very significant carbon dioxide emissions savings. Uh, these are obviously quite significant capital investments, but these will drive benefits for years and years and years. You know, the average life of an airplane is 20 to 25 years. So you're making this investment up front, uh, but it's driving significant benefits over the course of time. Uh, and then we think about the uh, fuel um, uh, we think about the sort of uh, the regulatory uh, environment that we're seeing for, or for, for fuel. So um, the airline industry, actually, I think uh, one thing I will give us credit for uh, is Corsair. Has anyone heard of Corsair? It is the airline um, plan to create a global framework uh, so that we all are using the same form of uh, um, offsetting the impact of carbon uh, growth. And so the industry said from 2020, uh, we as an industry want to provide carbon neutral growth going forward. 
Uh, and uh, this was uh, something that was worked through ICAO. Uh, it took many, many years to uh, take place, but it was very important to the industry because if we hadn't have done this, if we hadn't taken the leadership role, every country would have come up with its own scheme and it would have looked very different. And the regulatory burden of airlines flying into different countries um, uh, and having to kind of collate all the information and make that work would have been very, very challenging. And so when we think about uh, the uh, Corsia, it provides a global framework. So you may remember a few years ago, the EU had an emissions trading uh, pl plan, a uh, program that uh, US, China, and other countries resisted. This replaces all of that. And there are a number of things the industry can do to offset its carbon growth. So for example, uh, I talked about aircraft technology. That's gonna be a big part of the story for JetBlue. We're investing in state-of-the-art airplanes that are much more efficient. Um, operational improvements. Um, something, unfortunately, that uh, we believe very passionately about that didn't happen was air traffic control reform. Uh, as I said, that the, um, the, uh, we have very congested airspace here, uh, particularly on the East Coast, uh, and we are using fairly antiquated technology. Uh, and much of the world is leading us in, in satellite-based uh, technology to monitor where airplanes are. And so we were a big supporter of air traffic control reform. But um, there are other plans being developed to, again, make the system more efficient. But uh, if, when I looked earlier today, we had over three-hour ground, we had a th over three-hour delays in Newark. Uh, LaGuardia was two and a half hours. Maybe that's why some of you were here late or leaving early. Um, but you know, during many parts of the summer, those numbers are what we would see uh, on a daily basis. So as an industry, we have to continue to be focused on some of the operational improvements and also sustainable fuels. Uh, JetBlue is a leader in sustainable uh, fuels. Um, we've already announced that uh, over the next uh, couple of uh, few years that uh, up to 4% of our uh, fuels will be purchased through uh, sustainable sources. All of these things will allow us to uh, offset the costs of uh, Corsair uh, as they happen uh, over time. And then we talk a little bit about climate risk and um, how we think about risk, particularly for an airline like JetBlue uh, that has so much of our capacity deployed into markets like the Caribbean and Latin America. About a third of our capacity uh, takes place in uh, the Caribbean and, and Latin America. And so if, if we go back uh, a couple of years, uh, we remember the 2017 hurricane season. I hope we all remember that. Uh, we had Irma uh, and Maria. Um, we had Harvey. Um, and two of those hurricanes, Irma uh, and Maria, went right through uh, the JetBlue network. Um, and uh, it was, I've been in this industry 30 years. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, as, a, as a leader, I spent quite a bit of time uh, down in Florida, down in Puerto Rico, uh, doing rescue, mis uh, rescue missions to other islands in the Caribbean. It really was a huge uh, effort by the, uh, all of us to, to do what we c can to uh, support the communities that we fly. Now, a lot of people were looking at that and saying, this is going to be a disaster for JetBlue. You know, this is going to hit your business very, very hard. Uh, and yet, it, it had some impact, but I think nothing like uh, the impact that many uh, felt. And the reason is how we think about our business. And so when I say a third of our business is in the Caribbean uh, and Latin America, yes, the tourism is a huge part of that. Uh, flying people from here to vacation in those countries and islands is obviously a big part of what we do, but it's not all of what we do. And a significant portion of our business is visiting friends and relatives, uh, particularly in markets, markets like uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, you can see here when uh, um, those lines correspond to when uh, the hurricanes hit. So if you look at Maria, you can see that we definitely saw the leisure business take a very significant uh, downturn uh, because hotels were closed for reconstruction. Uh, and, but we saw um, the rest of it come back very quickly. And the other thing that we saw was that, yes, uh, people may not be traveling on vacations to the markets that were hit 
by the hurricanes, but they were flying to other Caribbean destinations. And an airline, unlike a hotel, can pick that asset up and move it. Uh, and so we move uh, resources very quickly into some of these other markets uh, that had not been uh, impacted by these hurricanes, whilst making sure the communities that were uh, completely uh, upended and impacted by these hurricanes knew that we were there with them. You know, we, we still did uh, a lot of work locally in the community, and we made a commitment that as soon as the infrastructure was back, we would move the airplanes uh, back, uh, and we did that. But you can see from this slide how quickly <coughs> the VFR business recovered. So by November, it was really back close to where it was before the hurricane season hit. Uh, so you remember every, all that noise at the time, it was going to take you a year for all of these things to come back. It took a month. It took a month uh, to two months. A lot of uh, people who lived in uh, Puerto Rico, the Commonwealth, uh, they settled uh, in different parts of the U.S., but Central Florida was uh, over 100,000. Um, is it over 100,000, Sophia, moved to Central Florida? Um, and you can see here, I've got an example of what happened to industry capacity between uh, San Juan and Orlando uh, in that time. And so you can see that between uh, September 17, when Maria hit, and September 19, uh, industry capacity to the, uh, between San Juan and Orlando has increased nearly 40, 50% to again, accommodate all of the business that is now flying between, uh, because a lot of people are still living there, but they're going backwards and forwards, they're visiting friends and family, they're involved in the reconstruction effort, they've got businesses that they're uh, still have in Puerto Rico, but they're living in uh, Orlando. And at the same time, you can see that um, uh, from a JetBlue perspective, uh, our unit revenue in this market also went from being below uh, the system average. So this was a market that was performing uh, under our average performance uh, to a market that pretty much has spent most of the time since uh, above it. So again, you can see that whilst we may not be able to control uh, weather events uh, that, we, that we see like the hurricane, how we respond to that uh, is very important from a sort of a investability perspective. It's very important for the health of our company. And our ability to move assets around, I think, is one of the unique advantages that the airline industry has. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the hurricane and the fleet bit. I just wanted to talk to you now about another very interesting case study, because um, getting people into this industry uh, is really important. We are a growth industry. Uh, the airline industry represents about 7% of US uh, GDP, uh, if you include the travel industry, as, as uh, was said earlier, it's, it's higher than that. But the number of pilots in the US is on a steady decline. And um, this is an important issue because we have, uh, there's a mandatory retirement age of pilots of 65. Uh, and we have a number of pilots at the large legacy airlines that are coming up for retirement. Uh, and so and there isn't enough new pilots coming into the system to uh, make up that supply shortage. Uh, so as I say to my 15-year-old daughter, now's a great time to learn to fly and be a pilot. But the challenge is, the challenge is, the cost of becoming a pilot is really high. So you may have a dream of flying, but how do you make it, uh, how do you make it happen? It's about an average of 85,000 uh, to become a commercial airline pilot in the US. And the other thing this does is it makes it a very hard career to access for huge parts of our community who just don't have the ability to pay that up front. Um, and by the way, some people spend a lot more than 85,000. That's an average number. There's a lot of people who are need, sort of doing uh, college degrees, learning to fly, um, getting that 1,500 hour requirement, and um, spending more than that. So we thought about that as uh, JetBlue, and this, this is, um, so this is, uh, sorry, this is saying that in the US we're expecting a deficit of around uh, 15,000 pilots um, in, in the uh, US, which is a lot, right? Um, and as you can see, we're a younger airline, so it's not so much of a big issue for us. 
We only have about 4% of our pilots that are due to retire in the next five years. But at um, uh, the larger legacy airlines, you can see it's a quarter, a third of their pilots are due to retire in the next five years. Um, and then if I look out 10 years, even at JetBlue, we still have now 15% of our pilots. So that's based on how big we are today, over 500 pilots just at JetBlue who need to retire. So we clearly have to replace these pilots. Um, and the, you know, the other challenge I mentioned is that um, the uh, diversity uh, is uh, nothing that we can be proud of. 97% uh, of pilots in the US in 2014 are the same race, and 91% are the same gender. Uh, and that is also something that I think is uh, something, as an industry, uh, we should feel a lot of urgency to do something about. So we looked at it from a JetBlue perspective, and you know, we always kind of consider ourselves an innovative uh, company. So how can we solve this? So we started creating gateway programs. We started creating ways for people to come and fly for JetBlue. Uh, so we partnered with a number of smaller airlines. Uh, we partnered with uh, uh, university courses to create people a path into flying JetBlue. You know, one, of the <coughs> one of the requirements uh, before you can fly now is you have to do a certain number of hours. That was a change that the FAA made a few years ago in response to the Colgan Air uh, crash, which you may, may recall. I think the gateway that I'm probably uh, most proud of uh, out is our, our gateway program where we take people with absolutely no flying experience at all and we turn them into pilots. And our ability to take people who uh, have always had a dream of flying and teach them to fly, uh, I think is probably one of the best things that we'll ever do as a company. Uh, and we're nearly two years into this program now uh, and uh, all of the data and everything that we are tracking with this group uh, just because strengthens our belief they are going to be uh, the most incredible pilots. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it's also making dreams happen at a much lower cost for people than it would cost, it would take them otherwise. And so, and we're also seeing greater uh, diversity uh, in that group as well. Excuse me. So, I think, uh, uh, so I showed you those uh, diversity, I should say lack of diversity numbers earlier. Um, and we're now seeing uh, five times more underrepresentative uh, groups uh, represented in, in this Gateway Select program. So still not enough, right? It's still way short of where it needs to be, uh, but it is a small step. And we're also seeing double the number of women apply. So again, still a small step. We have a lot of work to do, uh, but things are moving in the right direction. So just to hopefully some examples of the way we think about uh, ESG uh, uh, in sort of how do we think about our company, both in the short term on delivering our commitments to our investors, but long term to make sure that we can have a long term sustainable <coughs> business that continues to offer a differentiated culture for our crew members, uh, because we think that's what powers uh, everything else in our company. Uh, we think that these building blocks uh, are going to guarantee the, uh, the pipeline into our industry. It's not just pilots where we face shortages. Uh, maintenance, uh, uh, crew member, uh, maintenance technicians in the U.S. is also facing a similar shortage. And again, these are great jobs for people who don't necessarily want to go to college. Uh, these are very, there's a lot of very well-paying jobs in our industry. <coughs> and so we guaranteeing the pipeline of labor, investing in fleet and new engines to make sure that we can keep our operating costs down over time. Both of those are important long-term building blocks that will allow us to ensure that we can deliver uh, uh, improved margins over time, both absolute and relative to our uh, airline competitors. And with that, we'd like to arrive at the gate a few seconds early. And so I'm going to start with 35 seconds left on the clock. Thank you. <laughs> Thirty seconds ahead of time. That's great, um, and wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? It's going to be some question. Uh, I'll turn to Erica. Um, 
Wait, well, your mic's coming in. It's important because it's live streamed. And um, before you go, um, if you're online um, watching this webcasting, um, please go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot C-O-M, pound C-I-F-6, C-I-F-6, and you can submit your questions online and we can uh, put them in the mix as well. Sorry. Thank you for that, Robin. Two quick questions. The first, um, some of the airlines, I think you may be among them, have said that they'd like to cut uh, carbon emissions by 50% um, uh, by, I think it was 2050. So based on what you've said in terms of the engines and the fleet, is that how we get there or are there other ways to get there? So that's the one question. And if I may, the second question relates to um, some of the airlines kind of lobby, even though they talk about emission improvements, then they lobby against regulations for emission improvements. So there's an inconsistency there. Can you make some broad comments on that? Sure. Uh, so yeah, so um, uh, on your first point, so Corsair, which is the, um, uh, the global uh, standard, uh, it's uh, carbon, uh, it's, uh, it's um, 2020 carbon free growth, and then 2050, it's, so you want to neutralize the uh, additional carbon impact of your growth. And by 2050, the idea is to halve, you know, have halved it. I think um, new technology will definitely go a long way towards that. And I think the good news in our industry is there's such an alignment between that and sort of the financial imperative because fuel is either the number one or number two operating cost of any airline. Uh, you know, I, I think in the US, we definitely have an opportunity if we can um, you know, everyone talks about the infrastructure on the ground. We need to have new infrastructure in the air. Uh, that will also go a long way towards that. Uh, through our, uh, we didn't have time to talk about it, but we have a, a, a subsidiary called JetBlue Tech Ventures. Uh, one of the companies that we've invested in is a, an airline called Zunum. It was a joint investment with Boeing, uh, and they're looking to build electric airplanes. And so we think oh, by 2050, uh, sort of electric air travel is also going to be a very uh, real or alternative. And so, you know, we, we believe all of those measures uh, with some others uh, will go to uh, reduce it. But um, again, just moving to, uh, once the world can move to satellite-based navigation uh, and positioning of all airplanes, I mean, when you fly from here across to Europe, right, the, the, your position is known because the pilot's calling that in. Right? It's not... There is nothing, no, the, you know, they, there are uh, entities putting up um, more advanced sort of uh, satellite-based navigation, uh, but there's large parts of the industry that is not even there yet. So you're following very inefficient routes because they're routing you between different points. Again, we can move to a, you, you move to more straight-line flying, you move to more precision approaches. That's also going to have a very significant impact on, on uh, carbon uh, growth as well. And then the, sorry? Lobbying, so, you know, we've, I mean, I, again, I only speak for JetBlue. Uh, we were very focused on Corsair. We do believe having one solution for the world is the right thing to do. Uh, and it was a complex negotiation because you had different countries with different views. You had some who wanted to, uh, you know, uh, tax the collective industry, uh, not, ta you know, put a, uh, the emissions uh, obligation on the collective, others who wanted it on an individual carrier. Uh, you had other parts of the world growing more quickly than others. Uh, and yet, actually, it's one of the things that I think that the world came together to do a pretty job, good job in. Now, you, you might have critics who say it's not enough uh, and it should happen more quickly, um, but at least we have something now that we can work on. Uh, and, you know, at the moment, um, uh, all the countries that signed up for it seem to be committed to it. This question, two questions online. Um, I'm going to go with, uh, you know, your commitment to Puerto Rico uh, and the efforts that you made there was uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, so when's JetBlue going to fly to Europe? Ah, good. Gives me, I get that question all the time. Um, you know, that's something we, we so we are going to make a decision on that uh, by the end of the year. Uh, we actually, uh, when we look at... Uh, uh, the opportunity, you know, we see very high fares, particularly uh, in business class and first class between the US and Europe. If we think about what Mint, which is our premium experience, did between fares between the East Coast and the West Coast in premium, 
Uh, those fares are about half what they were five years ago. Uh, so we do see an opportunity to uh, disrupt that market. Uh, but you know, we've got to balance that with other things that we need to do and the sort of highest rate of return of the airplane. Uh, and so we'll make that decision by the end of the year. And the other question is, uh, I'm gonna frame it, expand on that a little bit, which breaking my own rule here. Um, so your commitment to SASB and TCFD and the whole arena of kind of standards and reporting um, is uh, something that seems important to your, your company. And how do you uh, view that and also the, um, uh, your views on biofuels? Uh, well, no, and I give uh, Sophia a, a lot of credit, who has definitely uh, uh, educated me in all of this and the uh, rest of the le leadership team. And, uh, you know, we, we feel that reporting is critical. I mean, there's all sorts of reports that we uh, uh, do, and yet here's something that is arguably probably more important than anything else. And so I have a framework for that. I think we, we think has been uh, incredibly important. And in terms of biofuel, so I mentioned this quickly, and then I didn't really have time to go into it. Uh, but about 4% uh, of our uh, fuel supply uh, over the next few years will come from uh, sustainable fuels, you know, from different, uh, different sources. It's, a, it's still a startup industry. Uh, you know, it's very, it's very fragmented. Uh, you know, we want to work with a number of different partners just to uh, make sure that we've got our bases covered. But when we think about the costs through Corsair, again, the other um, benefit for us in, in uh, investing more and more in sustainable fuels is that that will also reduce the cost of the Corsair uh, carbon offset schemes once that gets up and running. So there's a very strong economic case for us to want to do more in the area of sustainable fuels, not just because it's the right thing to do. Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, question over here oh, on the left. Hi, Chris Peterson from EY. And I appreciated your um, metrics and your focus on um, statistics around trusted employees that were affirming their trust in your culture and values, et cetera, and how, for example, they were 81% more likely to retain the company. Can you talk a little bit, was that linked to engagement surveys and studies? But um, the metrics were really impressive, so curious to to learn a little bit more about those. Sure, so yeah, we, um, uh, there's a number of internal uh, surveys that we do. They were not, they're, they're confidential, um, but we, we are able to take different sort of uh, slices of that and, and connect things together. So, you know, uh, where a crew member is, is identifying them as, uh, you know, uh, very committed to our value set, that they have a lot of trust in, in the company, uh, we see those connections with other things that they're able to do either you know the revenue side or we get a lot of customer data as well so you probably had all those surveys uh, on terms of your JetBlue flight so again we can connect all of those things together we were we now, now I've learned to call that big data you know I didn't know that at the time um, but um, but it's also important that uh, our crew members have confidence in that and so we go to extreme lengths to maintain the confidentiality of the data so there are no names or anything that goes with that because if if uh, if people lose trust in it, they'll you know, stop being so open with you in terms of how they're feeling. So the last question here is, uh, what keeps you awake at night and what gives you most hope when you look to the long term? Uh, well, what keeps me uh, awake at night, um, you know, honestly, in this job, it's just the safety. I mean, I know it's kind of, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, it's obvious to say, but... Uh, just making sure that everyone in your organization is focused around the uh, number one value of safety. Again, when I do my opening talk orientation, uh, I talk to all of our new crew members and I say that everyone is a chief safety officer. Everyone is empowered by me to call a timeout and if you see anything in the operation that you don't like, uh, from a scratch on an airplane that you don't think should be there, uh, from a, a bag that's been unattended, then take the time to uh, call it out and you know uh, the industry is very safe I mean I think the uh, again we tend to focus on what's not going well uh, as a society but the progress that's been made in the US airline uh, industry in the next 20-30 years last 20-30 years to make it safer has been phenomenal uh, and um, but you know nothing can be taken for granted and you know uh, uh, my di it's 
heartbreaking that our friends at Atlas Air, you know, lost that cargo airplane this weekend, and that's three amazing people on board that airplane. So we can't take any of that for granted. And all of us in the industry have a responsibility to make sure that we're keeping it as safe as uh, we can be. And what, what gives me hope is uh, this has been an industry that I joined 30 years ago. Uh, I started in, in this industry because I was selling duty free at the airport and I like the airplanes. Uh, and um, it's been a hard slog though. And I think what I'm optimistic about, particularly in the US, I think we now have a sustainable path where the industry can be successful, it can be profitable, uh, and I think that's good uh, for everybody. Excellent. With that, uh, everybody sign up for Mosaic before you leave today. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.